Good afternoon, or actually it's afternoon as I record this. I'm sure that it'll be morning when many of you watch this, but yet you can watch it at any time. Uh, it's good to uh, come in front of the camera again today and, and to uh, express truth from God's Word. Now, I can tell you I'm both excited and nervous about this message. Uh, we're going to talk about worry today. We're going to talk from Matthew chapter 6 where Jesus talks about the uh, challenge of, of worry and, and how it affects our lives. And um, there may be times in here where I may even stop and reflect a little bit and, and pause to think of exactly how I want to say things. I've got a lot of information here in my notes, got a lot of things that I feel I really need to express in this message. And um, yet um, I want to be careful because uh, this is a very... Uh, intense subject and it's something that I want to make sure I draw directly from God's Word and express truth so that it's helpful to all of us and uh, even I'm thinking right now how I'm going to condense this for Sunday morning in our live service because that sermon is shorter than what it is here on the online but um, I'm glad you're watching uh, welcome once again I, I, I praise God for the opportunity I think this is such an important uh, aspect of our ministry because uh, we need God's Word and we need it so desperately. So uh, bow with me in prayer for a little bit. Uh, I uh, prayed before I got started here, but I'm going to pray right now too because I really need God's help through this message. So uh, help me now and, and pray with me if you would. Gracious God, our Father, I, I know you're in charge and I know you've got something to say today. I know that you're teaching us uh, from the truth of your word. Your Holy Spirit is working in our lives. The uh, uh, message that Jesus presented many years ago on, on, the, sur on the mountain, Father, the, as he stepped back from the crowds uh, on the seashore and, and uh, just sp speak, he spoke and preached accordingly, Father. I know it's uh, so important. Uh, and I want to stumble through this prayer, Father, so help me. Uh, realize that I'm talking to you. You're my audience, dear Father, and yet people are listening as they, they, they see this video. So I pray that we can all listen carefully as we hear your word, that we can gain from it, that uh, this will be something that is beneficial, and, and uh, obviously I want it to be truthful. I, I pray, Father, that you would direct our hearts and our, our minds to what we need to be doing because worry is a problem. It's something that affects us day in and day out. There's no one anywhere that never has a concern or a, a, a difficulty because of worry. So help us in this, Father. Uh, guide the thoughts that I have in my mind. Uh, help me with the words. Guard what I say as I uh, explain these things, these truths. Help me to uh, be able to connect uh, with those that are listening. And I just thank you, Father, for Jesus. I thank you for what he did for us at Calvary. Uh, I, I praise you for that. That just amazes me, the fact that he would die on the cross for my sins, in all of our sins. And I thank you that Jesus Christ gave this message, and I thank you for that he, he also sent the Holy Spirit to help us sort through truth and understand truth and to apply truth to our lives. So may your spirit work. So use this today, Father, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, as I start today, uh, I've got a couple stories to tell. Uh, one of them is just from my own personal perspective right now. I, uh, early this morning, I was awakened um, by something that I'd been thinking about. And um, it, it struck me that, you know, hey, I'm going to be preaching later today on worry. And it hit me because I was maybe a little bit worried about something. I was concerned. And in a few moments here, before I give these opening illustrations and opening thoughts, I want to try to distinguish between times when concern is appropriate, when maybe worry is not a sin, when worry is not something that is, is detrimental uh, to our spiritual lives, but yet I want us to realize, as, as I um, uh, explain this, that, that worry... Uh, that it is harmful and it is is something that, that, that we need to deal with. So I want to just say that. Now, uh, first, just kind of a funny illustration, and this is one that, that uh, you know, you chuckle at different things. And I was told, in fact, this came from a book that, that I've got, 
Yeah, that uh, there was a certain individual that was struggling with worry, anxiety, concern all the time, and he just fretted over everything. And his counselor said, you know, uh, he joked, his counselor joked with him, maybe you ought to find somebody that will do the worrying for you. And the guy thought, wow, that's a good idea. And he went out and uh, he, uh, he bought somebody to worry for him. He, he paid somebody to worry for him. He, he, you know, he did this and, you know, sooner or later people saw him and say, Jimmy, you're a different guy than you used to be. What happened? He said, well, hey, I'm paying somebody to do my worrying for me. Wow, what's that costing you? Oh, it's only costing me $500 a month. Said, Can you afford that? Isn't that kind of expensive? He says, hey, it's not my worry anymore. He's got to help me figure out how to pay for it. <laughs> ah, that's kind of silly, I know, but... Um, you know, maybe it's good to laugh a little bit first because um, I want to start off now with the story of someone that came to me years ago. I was brand new at a church. I was pastoring and, and say brand new. I think I'd been there three months and we had a potluck one Sunday and one of the ladies from the church, one of the elders' wives came up to me and she says, Pastor Greg, I just want to let you know I'm addicted to worry. I can't stop worrying. I worry all the time. I've been in counseling for years. I've paid psychiatrists. I've paid psychologists. I've been on anxiety medication. It doesn't help. I just can't help but worrying. I'm a worry wart. And she said, I just want to let you know. She says, it's, it's a big problem that I face. And you know, I appreciated her honesty, but yet that's a troubling thought to think that somebody feels as if they're addicted to worry and they just can't stop. And that's, that's, that's a challenge. Now, uh, another story here, another, another illustration that I have, and this is actually from a Time Magazine article that was written 59 years ago. In 1961, March of 1961, Time Magazine published a cover story about the overwhelming presence of worry and anxiety in America. Now think, that was in 1961. It stated that the breakdown of faith in God combined with the accelerated pace and high tension of modern life produced intense anxiety in millions of people's lives. And it was so much anxiety that it would be correct to say that worry had become one of the most widespread and debilitating ailments of our time. The article went on to say that the results and symptoms of worry that were named in the article, substance abuse, marital problems, divorce, unpaid bills, overextended credit, suicide, wasting time just trying to unwind or relax, forgetfulness, distracted thinking, all these things, they are complicating the problem because they tend to result in more reasons to worry and fret. Now, stop again and think for a moment. This was written 59 years ago. I wonder what the article would say if it were written today. But I have to acknowledge that because of the way the media has shifted their thinking, I very much doubt that any news magazine or media report would suggest that, that worry is related to the breakdown of our faith in God. Now, the thing is, that is the truth. Worry is a result. The, the overabundance of worry in our culture is a result of the breakdown of our faith in God, our trust in Jesus Christ, our reliance independence on the Holy Spirit and we have to realize that we're not going to find any solution that will help us stop the surge of worry unless we realize that it is a breakdown of our faith we have to understand that but now as I as I move forward in, in this I want to just address the fact that I know there are people out there that struggle with anxiety they struggle with just a sense of concern that is overwhelming to them on a regular basis. And I don't want anyone to feel guilty in an unnecessary or un, 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 uh, um, uh, well, in, in an improper way. I, I don't want people to feel guilty in this. I acknowledge that worry sometimes affects me. It affects people in my family. It affects people around me. I have different people that I'm counseling, that I've counseled because of anxiety and fear and, and, and these types of concerns. And I think it's important that we realize that um, there's a difference between worry that is actually a sin 
that sense of anxiety and fretting that is uncontrolled, that it just won't stop and we're not willing to do anything to stop it because we think, okay, that's just a fact of life. And the idea of appropriate concern for what's best for ourselves, for others, for our loved ones, for family members, for people that surround our lives. Appropriate concern for others. When we say, hey, I've been worried about you, that isn't necessarily a sin. In fact, that's showing concern. That's appropriate. And I think it's also important to realize that there can be such a thing as proper preparation for unexpected situations, for emergency situations, for difficult times. It's not wrong to be to save saving money for a rainy day. It's not wrong to say, okay, I, I, I need to stop and realize that I need to have a plan in place for this or for that. Proper planning is not worry. And yet we have to understand that there are ways in which we can become obsessed with proper planning. We can become obsessed with having enough money. We can become uh, uncontrolled in our thoughts about things that don't need to control our thinking. And we need to be careful in how we deal with all these things. And I think it's, it's vital that we realize that um, uh, worry isn't always a, a detrimental sin. And worry isn't always something that is even something that's intentional. In fact, usually it's not intentional. But yet worry is something we need to learn to deal with. We need to, to address it in a proper way. Now, as I look at this passage of Scripture, as I realize what's here in this passage, I want to first uh, read the passage, and, and, and then uh, got some other comments I'll make, too, as I work through this message. But Jesus is, is teaching, and I'm going to read verse 24. That was in last week's message. But verse 24 is the context of what Jesus says this. He says, No one can serve two masters. No one can have two gods. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God Almighty and the idol of wealth or materialism. You can't serve both. Now Jesus goes on and says, Therefore, for this reason, I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than just simple clothing? Look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow, nor do they reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them well. Are you not worth much more than they are? And who among you, by being worried, can add one single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all of his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace for heat, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Catch those words. Jesus says, oh, you of little faith. He's addressing that to us and saying, be careful about how much you worry. And then he goes on and he says, do not worry then saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear for clothing? For the pagans, those that don't believe, eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. For, but rather, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. Wow. What a passage of scripture. And I've got several things that I want to say as I address this. And as I think, too, as I'm talking right now, how am I going to condense this for Sunday morning? I, I really want to address this properly in, 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 a, in a good way, and yet I realize that, you know, the, the, the distractions, it's a family-friendly service, it's a little different. But nonetheless, I'm thinking through, and, and, and I just want to address the fact that, you know, we worry about all kinds of different things. During this coronavirus crisis, you know, we worry about that. 
We worry about, am I safe? Have I been exposed? I'm worrying about whether someone else has been or, or going to the store and, and the different things that I might experience or that I might, might face. Uh, we worry about the economy. Over the last several months, we've worried about the economy. We've seen how some of our retirement plans have, have shrunk. Some of our savings plans have shrunk. We see where there's, there's a challenge on you know, the issue of money. The elders, as we've talked, we, we've been concerned. Will the church be able to pay its bills? And we praise God that God has provided in, in many ways. And, and we thank Him for your gifts. We thank God for the gifts you've given. We thank you for your gifts as well. But yet people worry about money. And that's an issue. That's a concern. People worry about the turmoil and the trouble that's going on throughout our country. People worry about the elections that are coming up. They worry about the future. What's going to happen? What will we find? What's, gonna, what's going on with the United States? What's going on with the world? We worry about our families. We worry about our kids or our parents. We worry about ourselves. And you know, sometimes people worry so much that they worry about, what am I going to worry about tomorrow? And yet, as we see in this passage, Jesus provides context for us by saying, therefore, at the very beginning of verse 25, for this reason I'm saying these things. What's the reason? He says, you can't serve two masters. And he's really saying, he's addressing the idea that uh, God requires, he desires and requires us to realize that he's, the foundation of our lives is our faith in him. And we must be totally trusting him. We must be depending on him 100%. And I admit to you that one of the worries or the fears that I have at times are how much have we diverted our faith in God through technology, through medical science, through various things that, that we tend to depend upon and we sometimes ignore the fact that God's the one that gives these things or we realize that God is the author of everything. And, and you know, it's important that we realize that that. Jesus is saying here that it all goes back to God. It all turns back to Him. He's number one. And we can't serve two idols. God is the idol, the, the, the God that we must serve. And when we bring other idolatry into our lives, we're, div we're, we're diverting our attention from where it's supposed to be. And we need to realize that as we see these things in this passage, I'm going to walk, work through it pass it verse by verse in a sense. Verse 25 tells us that worry distorts our vision of God and His promises. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life, what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear. Don't be worried about that. And worry distorts our vision of God and the promises He's made to us. God's promised that He's going to provide for our basic needs. I realize there are people that don't see that, and there are people that maybe don't don't real don't 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 have that perspective, and maybe we see that there's hunger in the world, and and that's a problem, yes. But yet God has has said to us that He's going to provide, and there's more than enough in this world. There's abundance in this world, and we don't want to have our our vision of God and His promises distorted by having wrong priorities. He says, "Is not life more than food?" in the body more than clothing? And, you know, this comes from what we studied last week in a certain sense. The eye is the lamp of the body, and yet if our vision or our view of God's promises is distorted by worry, if we're, our vision of God's promises are blocked by worry, what happens? Our faith becomes weak. Our fears increase, and our fears will control our lives. We need to be aware of that concern. We need to be aware of that challenge. Secondly, we see in, 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 in the next portion here that uh, worry is a distraction that keeps us from being able to sleep, to think clearly, to concentrate, to get things done. It deceives us into thinking that God might not provide us with what we need. But yet if we look at nature, we see something important. Remember the song, you know, I, I, you know, his eyes on the sparrow, and I know he's watching me. That's also a Bible verse. God is watching us. In this passage here, says, "Look at the birds. They don't sow. They don't reap. 
They don't gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. He says, are, not, are you not worth more than they are? See, in the, in the pecking order of creation, mankind, humans, are the hallmark of God's creation. And God cares for us. And we need to understand that we look at the birds of the air and they, they, don't, they don't do anything to earn their food. They don't do anything to plant food. And yet God feeds them. And we have to understand, God is our Heavenly Father. And we can't afford to lose sight of the fact that He is our Heavenly Father. Worry keeps us from seeing matters clearly. It blocks our vision of our Heavenly Father and His faithfulness to us. Worry causes us to ignore the providential care of God that He even shows to insignificant creatures such as the birds. Wow. Thirdly, worry is a waste of time and energy. Look at verse 27. And who of you, by being worried, can add one single hour to his life? Can one add one cubit to his life, as, as some translations say? It's hard to address this in a certain way, but worry is a, is a waste of time and energy. Worry is unproductive because it doesn't accomplish what it needs to give us. It accomplishes nothing but leading to unbelief, leading to doubt, and leading to fear. It distracts our attention from the matters of higher priority, and it paralyzes us from doing what is necessary at the moment. It fears what could be, what might happen, and often keeps us from recognizing what actually needs to be done at the moment. And it says there that worry cannot add one thing to our lives except for fear, doubt, and unbelief. Worry can't lengthen our lives. In fact, it'll probably shorten our lives. And we have to understand that from what God tells us right here. Fourthly, we get into something pretty intense here. Verses 28 through 30. And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all of his glory was clothed like they are. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today, and tomorrow its liable will be thrown into the furnace to provide heat, to provide fuel to the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith, and, um, you know, I, I think it's important. He says, do not worry then. What will we eat? What will we drink? What are we going to wear? He's, wor he's telling us that worry is an act of unbelief. Leaving the matter of food to the master is something that we need to do. Donna and I planted a garden this year. We watch it, we see that tomatoes are forming, little green tomatoes are forming, we see flowers on the zucchini plants. And as much as we want to see that fruit grow, we can't do anything to make it grow. We have to trust God that it will grow. And uh, we need to leave the matter of food to God Almighty. And such anxiety over what we're going to wear, you know, that's, that's unnecessary. You know, we live in a culture that is so concerned about food and clothing, and I'm going to get to that here in a few moments in number five. But you know, as we, we look around and consider the wildflowers, do they fret? Do they fume? No. We look at their beauty, and we're, we're, we're amazed at them. We think of, of Nate and Roberta's gardens, the garden party that they had, usually have every year. It's not going to happen this year, but nonetheless, we look at that. We look at the, the, the beauty of, of nature around us, and we realize that not even Solomon, the richest, wisest man ever in Israel's history, according to the Bible, he wasn't ever as beautiful as the flowers. And we can't attempt to imitate nature's beauty. Now, the concern that we have here is not so much a lack of knowledge. According to what Jesus says, it's a lack of faith. Notice his words. He says, O men of little faith, 
Worry can become for us a serious sin when it begins to doubt the goodness and the character of God. Whenever we doubt God's goodness, whenever we doubt God's character, whenever we say, God, why are you doing this to me? We are starting to move toward a place where we ought not to be. When we become overwhelmed by worry, we disrespect God's word. We question whether or not, God, are you trustworthy? Can I trust you or not? We doubt his sovereignty. We doubt his awareness of things that are going on in our lives. We doubt his power. We doubt his tender loving care for us. And I think it's important for us to realize that we need to understand God doesn't want us to become devastated by the effects of worry. He tells us these things not to make us feel guilty, not to make us discouraged or, or to disrupt our lives. He tells us this things, these things because he wants us to know exactly what we're supposed to be doing in dealing with worry. Now, number five, I want to just say this as I look at verses 31 and 32. Let's realize our culture is often focused on food and clothing. Look at the commercials on TV. Look at all the commercials for uh, fancy clothing, for what stores can do for us, what stores provide for us. Look at all the commercials for delicious restaurants or delicious food or diet plans or whatever else. And you know, there, there's a shocking statement here in verses 31 and 32. He says, Do not worry. Why? Do not worry then. What will we eat? What will we drink? What are we going to wear? Goes on, he says, the pagans, they seek these things. Those that don't believe in me, they seek these things. And he's asking us, do you want to be like the pagans? Do you want to be like those that are unbelievers? Do you want your lives characterized like those that they're failing to trust in God? You know, I think it's important that we realize that, that, that uh, um, Jesus says here about worry that we're only acting like the world acts. And I'm remindful, in fact, I'm going to bring this up a little bit later again, of what it says in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. He says, I exhort you, therefore, brothers and sisters, to give your bodies a living sacrifice, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. That is your spiritual service of worship. And then verse 2, don't be conformed to the world around you. Don't be poured into the mold of the world. And when we become obsessed and controlled by worry, we're allowing ourselves to be controlled by the model the world gives us. We're dominated by the thinking and the thoughts of those that don't know God the way we know Him. And He's saying here, if, if you don't believe this, just look at you know, Jesus is saying, just look at around you. Consider how people are and, and, and how worry affects things. And, and he's telling us that, that we, we need to be so careful. And, uh, you know, food and clothing, that's what the world is into. When we become preoccupied with these things, we're just like non-believers. We've departed from the distinctives that God asks us to have as characteristics of our lives when we allow ourselves to become worried and to fret over every little item. Now, I know that's challenging. I know that's hard. Those are difficult things to say, but now what I want to present next is the answer that I find in this passage. And I want to give six things. Six things that... There's, there, there are six statements that each statement begins with an A word, and then it explains other things too, but the answer which is an A word too, obviously. But I think we need to acknowledge that worry is a common problem. It's a pro common problem we all face. We need to acknowledge that. Worry is something we face. And yet, it's harmful, and it needs to be addressed. 
Now, as I look at this passage, what I realize from verse 24 on, worry is a result of the choice we make between serving God or serving the wealth and the materials of this world, serving idolatry. We might shrug off worry by dividing our lives into secular and spiritual. Well, that's the secular part of my life. No, that's the spiritual part of my life. Jesus is telling us here that there is no division in our lives. There's no secular part of our lives. There's no spiritual part of our lives. We are either secular or we are spiritual, one or the other. And we can't shrug things off and say, okay, that's just that part of my life. Jesus says we shouldn't do that. It's either one or the other. As followers of Jesus Christ, we're called to be 100% committed to either Christ or our culture. And we need to acknowledge that worry is a common problem. And my commitment to God is either going to set me on a path that will help me deal with worry, or it's going to set me on a path where I'm going to reject God's goodness. Worry denies God's wisdom by suggesting that God doesn't know what's best. Worry denies God's love by considering the idea that God doesn't care. Worry denies God's power by thinking that God can't do what he promised he's going to do. By saying that he isn't able to deliver me from what it is that's caused me to worry in the first place. We need to acknowledge that worry is a common problem we all face and we must look at scripture properly to deal with it. Secondly, it's important for us to analyze the content and the character of my faith. Each of us needs to say, I need to analyze the content and the character of my faith. Worry, worry will dispute and destroy the idea that God is trustworthy. It challenges his promises. It challenges the idea that God knows what he's doing. That God has a plan and a purpose for our lives. It challenges us and leads us into doubt and fear. And therefore, it's, it's important that, that, that we analyze just how strong is my faith? Where is my faith being placed? Am I trusting in money? Am I trusting in my bank accounts? Am I trusting in my estate? Am I trusting in my job? Am I trusting in all the things that surround me? Is that where I get my security? Is that where I get my identity? Is that where I am, I am, I am who I am? No. We need to analyze the content and the character of my faith. How strong is my faith? And then that leads us to number three. We analyze the content and character of our faith, and we also adjust our priorities. I need to adjust my priorities from time to time. Each of us needs to adjust our priorities from time to time. We need to look at ourselves and say, what's important in my life? What's important in my lifestyle? What are the main things that, that I need to have as a focus for my life? I think the coronavirus crisis has made a lot of us stop and think a little bit. And that's good. But yet I think we're, we're probably, I believe that we're thinking differently now than we did back in March. And we're looking at things and saying, okay, this is a fact of life and maybe some of our, our attentiveness to what God wants us to be doing, what God wants us to be thinking, maybe it's changed a little bit. I can't say how. But we need to ask ourselves, what's most important in my life? What's most important in my lifestyle? Have my priorities, have they been focused on what God desires for me? What takes the majority of my time? What gets the most of my attention? How often do I pray how often do I pray fervently for what God's will might be? How often do I ask God to guide me and direct me into the things that I need to be doing? How often do I ask God for opportunities to share Jesus Christ with others? 
How often do I pray? I ask that question in view of what it says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Don't be anxious, but instead pray. And the peace of God will guide your heart and your mind, will guide and guard your heart and your mind to the direction that you need to be going. We need to ask ourselves as well as we adjust our priorities, how is God calling me to focus more on eternal matters? Do I care about my unsaved family members? Do I care about my unsaved co-workers? Do I care about my unsaved neighbors? Do I care about those that are a part of my life that have never trusted in Jesus Christ? Am I afraid to address the issue of eternity with them? When our priorities are not considerate of the fact that someday everyone is going to face God's judgment, we have to realize that those priorities need to be adjusted. We need to consider eternity. Maybe in a personal way, some of us need to stop and consider the eternal values that we've established for ourselves. Am I storing up treasures here on earth that are going to rot away? Or am I storing up treasures that are going to bring me rewards in heaven? The judgment seat of Christ. I talked about that some last week. And I think it's important that we adjust our priorities. Number four, we need to actively pursue God and ask Him for the ability to honor and glorify Him. We need to ask Him for that. We need to actively pursue God and ask Him. Notice what it says in these verses. Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. I admit, I forgot to read that before. So forgive me. Notice verses 33 and 34. Seek first. It says, but seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So, do I seek first God's kingdom and His righteousness? Am I actively pursuing God and asking Him for the ability to honor Him? How do we do this? First of all, I think we need to look in God's Word. And what are the instructions he gives us? What are the commands? Matthew 28. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Teach them to obey the commands I've given. As Paul says, pray for one another that the doors may be open for all of us to share Christ with others. Do I look for the instructions on how to deal with controversies in my life, with broken relationships? Do I look for God's instructions on how to, to respond to other people when they say things that I may not like? Do I look in the instructions of, to what God tells me to do in the areas of, of discipline for myself or discipline for others? Do I look for God's instructions on how to raise my children or to deal with my adult children? Or to deal with my adult parents? Do I look for God's instructions and His commands and His Word? I'm actively, I need to be actively pursuing God and asking Him for the ability to honor Him. Do I set goals that lead to godliness? Do I set goals in Bible study? Do I set goals in discipleship? Of discipling someone else? Of having a disciple that disciples me? Of having a mentor? Do I reach others with the gospel, set goals that lead to godliness? Do I have a faithful involvement in church activities, in ministry activities, or am I sitting on the sidelines? Am I using my spiritual gifts and my talents to bring honor to God, or am I using my gifts and my talents to store up treasures here on earth? Am I making cheerful, careful choices about my relationships and my friends? Do I have accountability in my life? Am I setting goals that lead to godliness? Going back to the point itself, am I actively pursuing God and asking Him for the ability to bring glory and honor to Him? Number five, as we look at this passage, we need to anticipate exactly how worry will distract me 
and distort my thinking. I need to anticipate how worry will distract me and distort my thinking. He's telling us here, one day at a time. Just like the Israelites in the, in the wilderness. One day of manna at a time, except for on the Sabbath day, of course, or the day before the Sabbath day. But yet, one day at a time, daily grace. God never gives us grace in advance of the struggle we're going to face tomorrow. God always gives us grace for today. You can't store up grace because God gives us what we need each and every day. I can't store up today's grace for tomorrow, and I don't need to. God promised he'll supply me enough grace tomorrow because each day is sufficient to itself. Today's grace is for today. If we worry about tomorrow, we're misusing today's grace, and we might become worried or flustered, or we may fret over things we don't need to fret over. God gives us grace for every moment. He gives us grace for every challenge. Paul said, I, I went to God several times because of the thorn in my flesh. This is in 2 Corinthians toward the end, chapters, 12 and chapters 11 and 12. He just addresses these ideas. And he says, I asked God to remove the thorn from my flesh. And God says, wait a minute now. My grace is sufficient for you, Paul. Each day I give you enough grace to survive and to live for me. God's never early in the grace that he gives us, and he's never late in the grace that he gives us. If we trust him, he's never late. We need to anticipate just how worry might distract us and distort our thinking. And that's one of the things we need to learn to do. How am I going to be worried about this, or how am I going to be worried about that? And how am I going to guard my, my thinking, guard my life with God's word, with promises from God's Word? Do I memorize Scripture to gain insight into the promises of God's Word? Or am I focused on things that will keep me from being able to guard myself in those areas? We anticipate how worry might distract or distort our thinking. One day at a time, God's grace is sufficient. God's promises are faithful. God's Word is true. And that's important. Finally, Number six, we need to allow God's Spirit to control our lives. I need to allow God's Spirit to control my life. I mentioned earlier Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, I exhort you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, which is, which is acceptable to God, it's also your spiritual service of worship. You worship God by doing this. And he goes on in verse 2 and says, Do not be conformed to this world, but rather be transformed by how the Holy Spirit renews your mind, by the Holy Spirit changes your thinking, by how the Holy Spirit controls your life, and then you will be able to prove what is the will of God to a world that's looking at us and saying, Okay, those Christians... How do they live their lives? How do they store up treasures in heaven? How are they dealing with the issues of worry, the issues of, the issues of concern? And I'm going to go back to Romans 12, 1 and 2, because I've been, been, been exposing different ideas from this passage rather than reading the passage itself. I'll, I'll read it again, and then I'll explain just a couple things before we close. He says, and don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove to others, to the world around you, exactly what is the will of God. And they might see that it is good, it is acceptable, and it's perfect. To explain, we are living testimonies for the Lord Jesus Christ. We are His ambassadors. I've said many times recently that I've never seen a time in my life when it's been more important for the church to be the church. The ones that are called out of this culture. That's what church means. To be called out of the culture to represent God and to show the world exactly what God can do in our lives and in their lives as well. And if we are going to be fret, fretting and worrying like the world does and not allowing the Spirit to control our lives, 
then we're falling short of being the ambassadors for Christ that God enables us to be. God gives us the ability to do that. And it's important that we realize these truths. Now, worry, it's a problem. We all face it. We all experience it. But I just want to say right now, as I'm talking to each of you today on, on, on this camera, in this camera, you know, don't be, feel, don't be feeling guilty about the fact that worry is a problem. But rather, be active in pursuing what God might do to help you deal with that problem of worry. And those six things I gave, you know, I, I'm gonna go, I can go through those quickly right now once again. The six ideas. I'm not going to expand, expand. I'm not going to expound. I'm just going to say, number one, if I could find it, acknowledge that worry is a problem. Acknowledge that it's something that needs to be addressed. Number two, analyze just how strong is my faith. Analyze the content and character of my faith. Worry disputes and destroys our faith. And if our faith is strong, then we recognize that we can deal with worry. So if my faith is weak, I need to dig into God's Word and say, okay, help me, God. Help me to, to, to become stronger. Number three, adjust my priorities. How often do I pray? If I'm anxious, do I pray instead? What takes the majority of my time? What's the most important activity of my life? Where does God fit into my priorities? Do I actively, number four, actively pursue God and ask Him for the ability to honor Him in all that I do? Am I seeking goals toward godliness? Or am I seeking goals that are toward my own life? Do I anticipate, number five, how worry might distract and distort my thinking? Am I preparing for that by recognizing one day at a time God's grace is sufficient don't borrow tomorrow, today's grace. Don't, don't misuse today's grace in trying to worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow, he'll give you enough grace for that. And then finally, that last thing, allow God's, to, God's Spirit to control our lives. Wow. Worry. It's a challenge, but we can handle it. Because God's involved. And God provides. Pray with me for a few moments. Father, thank you for being our, our, our Father, our Heavenly Father that provides for all our needs. Thank you for your greatness and your goodness. Thank you for your presence in our hearts and our lives. I pray, Father, that you would guide and guard us day by day. Help us to see how you're at work in, 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 in the world around us and also in our own personal lives. Help us to acknowledge how the challenge of worry is something that we can deal with if we follow your guidelines and your instructions in Scripture. Help us to overcome the challenge that we have of being anxious and being worried by prayer, by other matters, Father. Help us in all of it. I pray that this message is, is, is something that is encouraging to every one of us, Father. I know it's encouragement to me in certain ways, in special ways. It convicts me and it challenges me. So, Father, help us to apply these truths to our lives. Take care of the special needs that surround us. Help us in the days ahead. I pray that you might bless the ministries of our church. And, Father, as I pray so often, I ask that you might literally destroy the spread of this virus. Stop it from spreading. You are all powerful. You are almighty. And I know, Father, that you would receive glory and honor from many, many people if you would do that because we would recognize that you stopped it and did something amazing, something miraculous. I don't pray that as any type of a, a, a joke or any type of a, well, wow, let's test you, God. I pray that knowing that you are almighty, you're all powerful. So please, work by protecting, and I pray you'd stop the spread of the virus. Allow us to be able to get back to doing the work of the ministry face-to-face, person-to-person, and giving honor to you. Again, help our church 
help our ministry, help us live our lives for you. And I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching. I realize maybe I look at the clock there. It might have been a little longer than what I sometimes do. But it's important. It's a subject that cannot be ignored. So I pray that God will provide blessing for you from this. I thank, you for the, I thank God for the privilege, and I thank you for watching and, and listening. Um, I look forward to being able to be with you in days ahead. I, I trust that God is going to open, open up our, our, our culture more and more. Uh, I pray that he might help us to be able to find ways to, to minister even more effectively. So um, thank you, Lord bless, and we'll see you next week.